Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the East Lake Animal Education Centre. We're starting this episode a bit sad, actually, and not just me. <laughs> um, our last Arctic fox uh, is about to die, and down she goes. And there we go. We are now without Arctic foxes at the East Lake Animal Education Centre. So I figured we'd uh, fill out a little memorial for her, and we'd put it right at the front of the reptiles, amphibians, insects, and arachnids building. And uh, we do go ahead and dismantle the habitat. You can just sort of see it in the background there. Uh, the prairie dogs also go, and the uh, wallabies, reindeer, and fallow deer have already gone as well. Um, they've been moved to other collections. Um, this is actually the first time I've filled out uh, one of these memorial plaques and I, uh, I found it pretty difficult. You can see there that that was the day I was recording this. So it was the 10th of July uh, 2024 and as I'm recording this voiceover it's the 16th of September. <laughs> so it's been a fair while. Um, numerous reasons for that. Um, work has been ridiculously busy. I'm off sick from work at the moment. I had a mental breakdown. For those of you that uh, weren't aware, I do suffer with uh, depression, stress and anxiety. And the type of depression that I have, I will have for the rest of my life. It's a persistent depressive disorder. Uh, but the expectations at work were just getting too much and what was being asked of us was too much and there was double standards and workplace politics and hypocrisy and just all of the things what can go wrong at work what are beyond your control did go wrong and it got to the point where um, I had suicidal ideation so I was sent to the A&E department of my nearest hospital and subsequently signed off sick uh, for a month at work um, but I've since decided that that is not the place for me at uh, work <laughs> um, so I am looking for another job and we'll see how that goes but we're not here to talk about that we're here to talk about animals and planet zoo and what's happening in front of you on the screen <laughs> um, so there's lots going on in this episode we do all but two habitats for the tropical hall and um, th there's a lot of exhibits and custom fences and things that go in like what you're seeing now where I'm building a custom fence it's sort of very natural very sort of reclaimed recycled looking um, for our Galapagos tortoises So I try and make it sort of themed, but also quite natural looking at the same time, uh, if I can. <laughs> and uh, hopefully I'm able to achieve that. Uh, we do pick up the pace uh, a little bit, don't worry. You can see there in the top left, it does say uh, one of the reindeers about to mature. When I was recording this, we still had the reindeer. I've since sent them to another collection because we needed the space to build the wetland hall, which is coming up. Uh, not the next episode of East Lake, but the one after. Uh, the next episode of East Lake is going to be the Komodo Dragon and the Garial. Well, we get a lot done in this episode, and that's why it's so long. It's uh, two months worth of work, essentially, is, is what we're uh, looking at here. Which is why it's so long. I didn't want East Lake to be long. Which leads me to the next point that I'd like to talk about is... These episodes of East Lake were meant to be easier to produce than Dunswall Zoo. So obviously Dunswall Zoo, a lot of its speed builds and, you know, I've just got to keep going once I've started building. Whereas East Lake was more of a stop start, stop start kind of thing. Uh, for those of you that watch other Planet Zoo creators, um, the sort of the style of the video, if you like, was meant to be like uh, San Bernardino Zoo by ZHS Plays, which has just finished. I'm really sad that that series is finished. It's such an amazing zoo. 
And um, so it's meant to be like that, essentially. It's meant to be short little bits of real-time footage and then a tour at the end. Uh, none of the episodes have really turned out like that. And I think it's just because I don't work like that. So I think what I might try doing for East Lake is just showing you the finished product. We'll do like 15 minute episodes where I'll give you an update on what I've been doing and go from there. Dunswell Zoo will remain the same. Um, that's still going to be speed builds and sort of animal facts and things like that. But this series was meant to be more of a... Uh, right, I'm working full time but I still want to make plenty of zoo content. Um, how can I do that quickly and easily? while still having time to myself and looking at ZHS players most of his episodes sort of sit between 10 and 20 minutes so that's what I was aiming for but none of them have ever been like that and the videos don't perform particularly well anyway mine uh, Sam Bernardino Zoo does amazingly um, but Eastlake doesn't do particularly well anyway but the next episode on the channel was meant to be Dunswell Zoo because I've not been in that save file since May. Uh, but I had this urge to get the tropical house done before I moved on. And so that is what I am trying to do. So we've got all the exhibits in for tropical and we're only two habitats short and that's going to be the next episode which will be the Komodo dragon and the Garial. Uh, but the next video on the channel will 100% be Dunswell Zoo. Because it's long overdue and I need to return to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I hope you've been well anyway. And the inspiration behind the Tropical House primarily was the Tropical Realm at Chester Zoo. Um, there are a few sort of other inspirations here and there from uh, like Crocodiles of the World, for example, to give you a hint of some of the habitats that are coming up. Uh, Crocodiles of the World, uh, Chester Zoo I've already mentioned, um, The Deep, which is sort of my local aquarium. Um, they've got a nice little section called Slime. Or it used to be called Slime. I think they've changed the name, but they've kept the layout. And they used to have like frogs and snails in there, and there's, there's now sort of fish and frogs and other animals. And that's essentially just like a modern corridor, what they've added at a later point. Um, and so we do our frog exhibits like that. That's where that inspiration's come from. So here, what I'm trying to do is build a natural sort of porthole um, but out of these fur tree pieces and it just doesn't look very good, so I get rid of it. It really annoys me that we only have this circular viewing window um, as a plaster piece and we don't have it in the other sets. Hopefully that's something we can get for Planet Zoo 2 when that comes out in a few years time. But yeah, I didn't like how it looked, so get rid of it. And now we're building the fence for one of our first habitat animals. So this is going to be a lizard, <laughs> a reptile, a monitor to be precise. And if you've seen the other episodes of the East Lake Animal Education Centre, you'll know that we already have a species of monitor in the desert hall, which means this can only be the remaining monitor species, which would of course be the Asian water monitor. Uh, this is actually my first time building for the Asian water monitor. I've never built for them before. Uh, the habitat still ends up being a bit too big for what you'd expect to see in a zoo, realistically. Uh, but it does meet their requirements in game and of course we are sort of in a, a challenge mode here. So I wanted to keep things as realistic as possible without adjusting the settings. So 
you know, they'll need the correct plants wherever possible. Um, the correct temperature. Uh, no, temperature's turned off, um, but everything else is still turned on. So, um, overcrowding, the amount of room they need, uh, planting need, uh, all that's still on. But weather, so temperature rather, is turned off. Just because I want it to be a realistic, um, realistic British animal education centre, and uh, you do see sort of zebras and things like that out in the cold, much in the same way that you have a covered tropical house, um, so you wouldn't need additional heaters for a, an Asian water monitor. Something like a tortoise, absolutely, which is why you saw me doing my own version of heat lamps, but uh, not for this. Excuse me. I'll have to get an extra layer. It's coming in a little bit chilly, but uh, the autumn chill's moving in. So all I'm doing here is two viewing windows for the Kuvia's Dwarf Cayman. Uh, initially I was going to use the, I think it's the Indonesian brick. But I, I like the bigger, sort of more hewn look of the uh, temple brick from the South America set. So we, we do that instead. And then here I'm just putting the rear wall in for the pool for the Kuvia's Dwarf Cayman. This is based on, inspired by, <laughs> um, the uh, spectacled Cayman habitat at Chester Zoo. They have two spectacled Cayman um, in there. So we have two Kuvia's Dwarf Cayman in here. It's also slightly inspired by uh, Flamingo Land as well. They have this temple theming in their Kuvia Dwarf Cayman habitat. Uh, they only have the one uh, Kuvia Dwarf Cayman at Flamingo Land. But we've got two, and they do breed. Um, we do have young Cayman by the end of the the episode but yeah it's, I hate doing lined pools in Planet Zoo I think they're so finicky and they're so difficult to do hopefully that's a feature we can have in Planet Zoo 2 because I know they've added pools to Planet Coaster 2 so hopefully that feature will carry over into Planet Zoo 2, but rather than pools for guests, it will be lined pools for animals. Where we can adjust the depth and things like that. Um, or we can continue to build pools the way we are. Which is just usually hold in the ground. <laughs> so all I'm doing here is putting a sort of mesh siding and mesh roof on no particular reason you know we don't have free flying beds we don't have uh, the availability for guests to climb over but I think it just looks better with it on rather than it just being open topped and cut off and I'm really glad I did it actually because on the roof I do uh, layers of the scaviola bushes so it ends up looking like really dark and like a jungle canopy and I really like the sort of vibe that it gives off so I'm, I'm really glad I did that in the end actually and again just doing my sort of implied heat lamps And we've got some planting in and rather than messing with the terrain I've just used a mud uh, 
a mud piece panel was the word I was looking for and I just sort of textured it coloured it rather to look like mud and it looks all right to be fair from from ground level now annoyingly the the roof and the sides don't match up um, but you can't tell when you're looking at the habitat because you're focused on the animals and the planting and you're not really going to be looking up much and there's some guest amenities so toilets Ordinarily, you probably wouldn't have these within a walkthrough sort of tropical house. They would be external, but because of the way Planet Zoo works and because of the size of this tropical house, I didn't really have much of a choice if I wanted to keep the guests happy. Um, there needed to be toilets sort of at this point in their journey. So that's unfortunately what we had to do, is put some toilets in. But I do sort of like how it turned out actually. It um it has a nice sort of jungly theme to it, a sort of little shack. Um it is clearly marks of its toilets of course, but I do really like how it looks. Now here we've got the counter for some drinks, just because that was the thing that guests were lacking the most. They're fine for food, they're fine for energy, they're now fine for toilets. But they needed some more drink so i put that little stand in there just around the corner from the toilets and that creates a nice little guest hub which we'll see in the final tour here i'm creating the fence for the spectacled cayman habitat this is inspired and well, based on um the spectacled cayman habitat at crocodiles of the world never been with crocodiles of the world i've only seen online images i really like how it looked so i thought you know i want to i want to build something like that and rather than just having a pair in here we do have i think we have a group of four something like that so you'll have plenty of opportunities to see the spectacled cayman from the side viewing all the above viewing and I just recolored it here and we're just going to copy it over make sure it lines up with the barrier nothing overly fancy and again with the lined pool this one was probably worse because this is a sloped lined pool at least the caimans was sort of like a straight drop lined pool uh, we're getting the angles right on this took ages and there's still two pieces what don't fit and for the life of me i can't work out how to get them to fit you can see the edges sort of overlap you'll probably see it in the the final cinematic tour it's more of a walking tour actually than a cinematic tour because we're a bit all over the place this episode so i wanted to do a walking tour just to sort of show you what the guests are seeing essentially And here we are with the tour, which takes up the majority of this episode. So we're in the little entrance area, and you've got the centipedes to the left, you've got the tropical hall sign and waterfall to the right, and then you've got the frogs and the Asian water monitor sort of straight in front of you. So we'll just swing around and get a look at those. He says. <laughs> So yeah, you've got your Amazonian giant centipede. You've got three viewing opportunities for these. You've got the side, the front, and the back. And we can see them there, just in that. Yep. You see, that looks all right from there. You can't tell that it's two separate exhibits. And then you get to there, and it's like, all right. <laughs> but yeah, I've... Uh, I've tried to make it look as natural as possible, but the idea for that one was a, a massive hollowed out tree trunk. It just didn't pay off, so I used lots of browns, lots of woods to evoke the same texture, just not the same shape. And here we have our Asian water monitor habitat. We will get another look at that later on. Then we've got our frog alley straight in front of us. 
So we've got our red-eyed tree frog. If I can actually find any of them. There we go. And now I've spotted it. <laughs> Yay, past me. <laughs> so you have the red-eyed tree frog. Just a really nice sort of colourful species to start us off with. It's just sort of chilling there on that bit of tree near the leaves. Then we have our lemons uh, dart frog. And there's two there. They're really, really tiny. Really tiny. And these are critically endangered, these ones. And then lastly is the golden poison dart frog. We've got a nice selection there. So there's three. There's one on the leaves, one on the rock, and there's one just sort of behind that plant on the left there. And again, just taking a nice long look at them because we won't be looking at them again anytime soon. Okay, moving on. We have our first habitat right in front of us. On our right is the butterfly journey. That's designed to be the exit to the butterfly journey. But straight in front of us, we have our Galapagos giant tortoise habitat. So there's indoor and outdoor showing for the Galapagos giant tortoise and they do actually spend quite a fair bit of time outside. The reason why I've got indoor and outdoor is because I have seen other large species of tortoise out in grass paddocks during the summer months, um, particularly sulcata tortoises. So I figured we'd give our Galapagos and our Aldabra tortoises in the next habitat. Uh, we'd give them the chance to go outside and get some fresh air, get some grass beneath the feet, that sort of thing. I just want to check what their traversable area is because obviously she was on that rock. But yep, yeah, she's fine to be on that rock. It's part of their traversable area. And it made for a pretty cool shot, didn't it? Okay, then here we have our green iguana. I've already clocked them. There's one on the left there, sort of lounging around on a tree. It's exactly what I want to be doing today. I'm really jealous of that iguana. And then this one is up front and centre. And even gives us a little, little head sort of nod. There you go. What a cool little dude or gal. Giant forest scorpion which doesn't actually look that giant when you see it. There it is. And then we have our Aldabra tortoises. We've got a lot of them. They had babies. And, um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of them. <laughs> it's a little bit more African themed, uh, this habitat. But yeah, we, we've got a lot of Aldabra tortoises. We're at max capacity for Aldabras. But um, there's only the one viewing for them indoors, the rest are outdoors. There's someone who needs a toilet, so it's good job we built those toilets further on. Uh, this bit to the right isn't done yet because I'm going to knock through there and we're going to build the uh, gharial habitat as an extension. Then we've got our spectacled caiman habitat, which is based on the one at Crocodiles of the World. So we've got four, I think, three or four uh, spectacled caiman in, in here. Uh, they can breed. Uh, that's what I mean about the panels where they don't align. Um, you could see the, the join. Uh, yeah, they can breed if they want to, but I've turned their breeding off for now. Just because we don't want too many mouths to feed before we can afford it. Then on our right here, we have the yellow anaconda. Um, this has too many in it, so <laughs> um, I need to do the exhibit management for that one. Uh, but this one on the left has the correct amount. 
of snakes in it. Lovely yellow anaconda there. Sort of up front. Lovely position. Lovely snake as well. You know, you don't really get the time to appreciate the exhibit animals much in Planet Zoo because the focus is more on the habitat animals. So I've gone ahead and corrected the um, the numbers in that secondary yellow anaconda habitat. Um, that leads outside and then to the right, those doors will lead to the Komodo dragon habitat. Ah, a lovely little couple at the zoo, look. With his hand on her shoulder and her hand sort of in his kidney. <laughs> uh, feed him to the crocodiles. <laughs> but yeah, we have this sort of sloped view and then this view here. I haven't covered that talk point in the cover that we made. I think actually up here it looks better not covered. So I've just left that talk point uncovered. You can see we've got a spectacled caiman there. And they've got access around there. If they want to, we'll go down to that viewing point when we get further on with the tour. Which is off ski for a swim. Off it goes. And with the glass viewing, you should be able to see it, yeah. And then we've got two others swimming over there. So there's definitely three. There could be four. I'm sure it's one male, three females. Is the uh, the ratio so? Yeah, you can see it's very popular up here. And then they've got some logs what they can bask on, things like that. Can get a bit crowded at times, but that's because the rest of the zoo isn't open yet. So all the guests are in this section, essentially. Uh, that's staff access only back there. Then on the right here, we have the Lesser Antillian Iguana. And there it is, just sat in the water. Oop, I'm all over the shop, there we go. Beautiful animal. Absolutely stunning. And then this one's up front as well. Wonderful. Absolutely brilliant. Look at that. Wow. And then we have our burrowing cockroach here on the left. And then we'll move on to... Uh, I forgot what's next. Uh, the Goliath frog, which you can never find. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen the Goliath frog in game. Even when I've put them in an exhibit like this, I've still never seen them. So I think that was one right at the back, but I couldn't be 100% sure. So I do end up sort of clicking on the habitat and finding where it is. You know, that's a mister at the back. So yeah, can't find it. <laughs> Yeah, there it is. Found it. <laughs> no, but in the other one, yeah, I, I just can't see it in here. Uh, 
Obviously, I don't recommend that you stand on exhibits when you go to zoos. But I needed to find where this individual was. And the female's at the back. You, you can't really see her, so we'll move on. And just before I forget, we also have the boa constrictor. Um, which was sort of on the right hand side after the lesser Antillian iguana. And like with all our exhibits, we've got two of them. Just because it's a nice money generator essentially. You know, two exhibits, two lots of breeding going on. So it's good to generate conservation credits and money that way. And then we have our little sort of guest services area. We've got our little drinks counter, which is proving to be quite popular. And the toilets as well. And actually, before I forget, there's a, another area that we have missed off completely. So opposite the Antillian Iguanas, there's a little path that goes to this little overgrown area down here. And we've got our beetles and snails down here. So we've got our... Ooh, is this the Goliath beetle? And then it's the giant tiger land snail. And then it's the titan beetle after that. There's the giant tiger land snails. And then the next animal is the titan beetle. So on your right here, you've got the Kuvius Dwarf Cayman. It's a very popular area, as you can see. But yeah, we've got our lined pool. And then we've got the an adult and a juvenile in the mud there. And then we've got our uh, albino dwarf came in on the left, which has come into shot. And there should be another youngster somewhere. I think the other youngster's up on that platform at the top. Yeah, there it is. Then to your left, you have another viewing point for the spectacled Cayman. So from here, you can see the pool and some of the land area. And then my least favourite is coming up next. On the left we have a series of exhibits called the Spiders of South America. Uh, there is one exception included in that, which is the Mexican red knee tarantula. Um, but for the purposes of, the, of this display, I've included it as South America. So, don't know what we've got first up. Uh, Brazilian salmon pink tarantula. It's, you can just see its legs there poking out. And that's all we need to see, so we'll move on. Oh, no, we get a better shot here, unfortunately. Here's a better look at the Brazilian salmon pink tarantula. I think we've seen everything we need to see with that, so move on. <laughs> I 
Then we have the Brazilian Wandering Spider. These are arguably worse. Because they look like house spiders on steroids. Ugh, there's one on top of that log. Ugh, there's one on the floor. Ew. Let's move on from this one really quickly. Because they're starting to freak me out. got the Mexican red kneed tarantula. Can't see anything in that one. And then in this one. Just there. Then in here we have the Goliath Bird Eaters, which are absolutely massive. And I think we've seen enough of them, so let's move on very quickly. And yeah, we'll, uh, we've, we're back at the Asian Water Monitor. So you've got this sort of underwater viewing. So it's a new build, so you can see it's just fur rock and plaster, there's no grime or anything on it yet. Little education cover point. Education point cover, rather. And then we should see uh, one of the Asian water monitors swimming. Yep. And then you've just got this little sort of avenue back to the iguana and the tortoises. Oh, this little avenue up here brings you to another viewpoint for the Asian water monitor before heading back to the entrance hall. And I might delete some of the water effects in this area because you can see them just under the surface there, uh, which is sad. But there's very little that we can do about that realistically and that just about does it for this tour my friends so I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you appreciate the work that's gone into this I'm sorry it's been a while I've just not really had the time or particularly felt up to it um, hopefully things are improving I certainly feel a little bit better now that I don't have the stress of work because I'm off on sick um, but we'll see what happens there and while we're here I will just show you through the butterfly journey as well um, so we've got these little vents that you saw in the speed build they're just sort of to blow away any butterflies that might try and escape on you uh, it's a very gentle breeze it doesn't harm the butterflies in any way then you've got the first uh, species of butterfly are the European ones so you've got the Old World Swallowtail, the European Peacock, and that's it for now, if I remember correctly. So these are sort of slightly more temperate butterflies, but they are still butterflies, so they do prefer that warmer weather, those warmer climates. And there's some lovely viewpoints here, like this feeding station, what's viewable between the trunks of this tree. I just love that so much. Yep, yeah, we'll continue on. So again, just got these butterfly houses put up at the end. It is a walkthrough exhibit, of course, so quite easy to get those in.
And we've got the giant Malayan leaf insect. You can see them on the leaf and on the log. They're blending quite well, actually. It doesn't look like it on the screen, but they are quite hard to find in game. They do blend in quite well. And then we then have our South American species of butterfly in here. So you've got your uh, monarch butterflies, your Menelas blue morphers, and your cloudless sulfurs. Uh, they're all in this walkthrough exhibit. Monarch butterflies, of course, being incredibly iconic. And again, you've got their feeding stations and you can see them resting on the bushes and things like that. And then you can see a third and final uh, butterfly habitat, butterfly exhibit, walkthrough exhibit, whatever you want to call them, uh, right at the end. And that is for uh, all the butterflies, that's a mixture of them. So just come around this corner here. I wanted this area to feel a lot bigger than it actually is. And then yeah, you've got more species of butterfly. Still the same species that you've seen in the other two exhibits, but these ones are mixed. So you've got your smallest ones and your biggest ones all together. So then behind this section, we have the a little waterfall, and a little pond, just a nice little decorative sort of thing. I didn't want to sort of overdo it or make it too um, overwhelming. But I did want a nice little water feature with lots of flowers and this nice little secluded area. We've got some vending machines and some tables there so you can sort of sit down and have a snack near the, the flowing waters and the little pond. And Yeah, it's a pretty popular area as you can see. And then we head out back into the tropical hall next to the uh, Galapagos tortoises and the frog alley. The so next time then we're looking at this which is the uh, Komodo dragon habitat and we've got two, one for the male one for the female and it does also expand outside as well we're gonna have a little bit of an outdoor area that's gonna be based on Chester Zoo uh, their Komodo dragon habitat and then we've got this little outdoor plaza here what we're gonna do and uh, put a little cafe in there excuse me uh, and then this green box here this is going to be for the gharial uh, that's going to be an indoor habitat what sort of attaches to the side here and then we've also got the little hall joining the tropical hall to the wetland hall uh, sorry the desert hall and it will also allow guests access to the wetland hall which will follow after that um, but the next video on the channel will be Dunzol Zoo because it's long overdue <laughs> there so thank you very much for watching my friends we're going to finish with our uh, Asian water monitor uh, please remember to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if indeed you have enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this I've been JW you can find me on Instagram at JW underscore YT Thank you very much for watching, stay safe, stay kind, and until the next time, bye bye for now.